Good evening. We are here to celebrate the 40th anniversary of the Macintosh, so maybe instead I should say, hello. Here with me to answer some questions about his time selling Apple computers in the early 80s and a lifetime working with the Mac for a very serious and granular discussion, Alfred de Blasi. Welcome. Absolutely. <laughs> Quite an honor. Um, and, and, you know, I, I will say, and I'm going to keep a straight face on this one, I did a fair amount of preparation H for this mm -hmm interview uh digging through, i don't think i need to hear about that yeah yeah well digging into my own personal uh, the, the bowels of my personal archives so uh mm. your first question was most people's knowledge of old computers begins with the macintosh can you lay out what the landscape of the apple II age was like the landscape of computers was was broken out by the word size of the system. So you had your mainframes, which were predominantly 32-bit systems. You had the mini computers, uh, which was dominated by, you know, Data General and DEC, 16-bit systems. And then you had, we didn't call them PCs, but we called them microcomputers, 8-bit systems. It, it was exciting. It was pioneering. It was borderline, you know, breakthrough, yet with some hobbyists in there as well. This was uh, the mini computer I learned on. This is a photo of me in, in 1978. Data General Nova 1200 mini computer system. Notice switches on the front, and uh, there was a paper tape reader uh, that read data, uh, pun you know, holes punched in, and then there was a dump, if I recall correctly, Wozniak. Uh, Data General, he, he played around with those systems uh, back then as well. Uh, but the, jumping from that to microcomputers, this photo from 79 or 80. Uh, so I'm with, you know, the killer Apple II system, with dual drives and a Centronics printer. And everyone else was learning COBOL and IBM, IBM mainframes. Like, Alpha, why are you playing with those toys? And I'm like... You have no idea how, how powerful these systems are. The toy uh, computers, yeah. Right, the, to right the, the toys. Before we had the disk drive, let's, let's go back in time. How, how did we, what did we do? We, 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 we dusted off the Panasonic cassette recorder and we loaded in Floating Point Basic. This is the Floating Point Basic demo. And um, also to clarify for the younger viewers, once you load that cassette in, which can take minutes at a time, that you then had to spend another 20 or 30 minutes typing in a program in, and then you had to execute it. Unless, though, you had Star Trek. <laughs> so there's the, there's the Star Trek app, and on the flip side was uh, the Star Wars game. But then we had um, this. It was just so brilliant. You know, the, the disc to the, the, the drive controller, all right? Uh, and this was just a work of art by Wozniak, uh, you know, above and beyond, of course, the, the computer itself. Um, and it saved you from typing the same program <laughs> each time. Uh, and uh, let me just, oh, I just so happened to have, all right, so here it is, you know, the Apple disk drive. And of course, the sound for the, for the older people of the, you know, that sound when you popped in the disk. Wow. We got the drive into the store. The first time we got the drive in. Uh, co-worker, Joey, are you sure we can, we can plug this card in with the power on? Oh, yeah, it's fine. Of course, we blew it out. So that was a bummer. So we had to wait, you know, uh, a week or two for Apple to replace it. Let's talk about the demographics of the buyers. Who, who was buying these systems back in, the, in those times? It was people with money. Uh, it was, you know, wealthy professionals, you know, Doctors, lawyers, accountants, inventory, payroll, general accounting, word processing, big thing. And then there was a program called PFS, which was like a free form, uh, a, a database program. You just laid out the fields on the screen and, and boom, instant database app. You know, once you configured the system with the extra drives and the language card and all the goodies, I mean, you were spending two, three, four grand in 1979, $1980, no jokes, a lot of money. People doing home finances on it. You had games was a big part of it. Chess, holy crap. Hey, you wanna see how powerful this thing is? Yeah, could try, try to beat it. You know, we had some customers in there for hours. You're getting pretty really? pissed off. Oh yeah, yeah, try to beat it. So Oregon played, played a good game. One of the big drivers was we want this in our home to help educate our children, help give our children an advantage. Uh, so there was some really great, useful stuff. 
uh, for it. But then, of course, the games. And, and I will say, games are a big part of the sales pitch. Someone wrote a program, I think it was called Fire Organ. I really have to find it. Uh, but I would tap off my stereo system and, mm -hmm. and split some of the audio into the cassette import, and it created a color visualizer. Wow. I mean, it was blow away. It was, it was, and I told people as I was showing this hooked up in my home, I said, this is going to be like in everyone's living room in the future. You, you'll have mm -hmm. a computer in your living room doing stuff like this. You had some crazy hardware from a lot of different companies for that, uh, for that system. You know, Steve Jobs didn't want to have a lot of slots. He only wanted like one or two for a printer. You know, it was Waz that really pushed to have eight slots, zero through seven. Zero was reserved for that language card. And then let's not forget the Apple II user groups. I mean, I think we had, there was a Long Island group. It had over 100 members, and we did monthly meetings. And, and it was great. Vendors would come in and, and show off all the new toys. And then as the meeting was winding down toward the end, we'd all be in the back copying the latest uh, shareware software. You were able to bang out copies pretty quick. So that was like, wow, yeah, that's a dual controller system. Wow. Uh, so the, the user groups, it was, listen, it was a lot of camaraderie back then, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and, and it, it was fun. What was after that, we had Apple III. I, I sold a fair amount of Apple III's. It was a, it was a gorgeous mm. system. You know, the problems, they had a problem with the, with the onboard real-time clock, which <laughs> didn't exist in the beginning. Chips mm -hmm. were popping out. There was some overheating issues, but they got it rectified. The operating system, you know, SOS, it was supposed to be pronounced SOS. Uh, was it a phenomenal seller? No, because it, 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 it had problems. But uh, the people that had them and understood the system and, and when it was working, they were, they were great. The keyboard was phenomenal. It was a great, mm. you know, great system. A lot of, you know, promotional materials for the Apple III. Uh, I still have one. I have one with the five megabyte profile drive and the matching monitor. Now, my friend Scott said, Alfred, you, 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 you can't turn that on. It, the capacitors are so dry it's going gonna, it's gonna to probably explode and, and stench up your whole condo. Of course, I say, nay, nay, my type of YouTube channel, I'm going to put the thing on my balcony, have a long extension cord, start the filming with a camcorder, turn it mm -hmm. on, and hope that it blows up. To me, yeah. that would be great footage. For the content. <laughs> Correct. And then it goes on eBay. <laughs> so then comes the Appalisa, the short-lived uh, first attempt at a Macintosh-like computer. What was it like uh, selling a Lisa? What was your pitch? Listen, people were used to green text on a black screen and, and seeing this GUI and, and what you see is what you get was, was just radical. And of course, the introduction of a rodential input device of the mouse, the icons, you know, the desktop accessories, the ease of use, uh, the integration of the apps, and, and what you see is what you get. And, and of course, the output on, a, on a, a graphical output on a dot matrix printer, you know, that went above and beyond the standard character set that was built into the printer was mind blowing. Pretty impressive what Apple did and, and encapsulating what the folks at Xerox Park had pioneered but never got to market. So when people talk about these old machines today, like one of the first things they mention is how expensive they were adjusting for inflation. You know, Lisa started at $10,000 and 40 some years later, it's more like $30,000. So back then, though, was that actually a shocking number for a computer like the Lisa? Like, was that was that a hard part of selling the machines or is that being added to the story retroactively? Oh, no, that was a, it was a tough sell. I mean, uh, the, the people at bought the Lisa. That was the ultra elite high-end corporate business of uh, more like a showpiece on the desk type of thing. Um, mm. uh, but overall from, from, from a sales point, it was, it was definitely a flop. That was very, very expensive. One of the biggest components of that cost was the memory. And if I recall correctly, Apple's cost on the RAM was close to $5,000. But that RAM helped it do its multitasking magic because remember, the Lisa had a true multitasking operating system. 
Uh, it was very, <laughs> it was it was a real OS. What were some of the other hit features of the Lisa that the few people who bought them actually loved? Uh, the changing of the fonts. <laughs> that was mm -hmm. like, when you were able to change the fonts on the screen, uh, that was like, holy cow. And, and having, of course, you know, the multiple overlapping windows and, and being able to just, you know, cut and paste. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. was just very new. And, and that was like a real wow factor. Uh, so Apple introduces the Macintosh a year later in 1984. How did you first hear about the Mac and what was your reaction? It was at the 1983 Apple Developer Conference. And, and what was priority there was uh, uh, Lisa and the Apple III were the main, the main topics. We're sitting here listening to Larry Tesla talking about the virtual memory management and whatnot on the Apple Lisa, there was a buzz going around in the audience about, you got to talk to this guy, Guy Kawasaki, and talk to him about the Mac. So like, that was like just buzzing through. Really, I, I can't imagine there'd be a lot of other discussion at an Apple three and Lisa <laughs> conference. <laughs> yeah, right. And, and you know, the whole thing was that it was, it was like a Lisa type technology at a lower price point. Okay. After that conference, uh, they showed us the 1984 commercial and basically said, yeah, we got something really hot coming out. So we didn't see the machine yet, but now we, we, we saw the commercial. And then, of course, I was at the announcement in New York City uh, at mm -hmm. the time. Now, now, Jobs was in California, but you know, we had other high-level executives in, in, in New York. Some people uh, got up in the middle of the meeting and went to the phones to call their stockbrokers to buy Apple stock. It was really very interesting. So do you remember using a Mac for the first time? Yeah. Uh, all the dealers were, were shuttled, in, shuttled into a room to experience the first experience of the Mac. And, and it was interesting, you know, uh, Steve Jobs, he, he loved music. He liked piano music. He, we were all handed out uh, an album by Liz Story, is the musician, and the album was called Solid Colors. So that was playing when you when we arrived at the dealer meeting the Liz Story's album was playing and you were handed a copy of the album um, and then you were shuttled into a room and they had you know whatever 50 max there and, and they sat us through the, the demo program and it was like you know wow you, you mentioned this when the Mac was first introduced Apple actually tried to sell both the Mac and the Lisa simultaneously you know, there were still a features the Lisa had like multitasking that the Mac couldn't do. So how did your pitch change after the introduction of the Mac? The release of the Mac did not change my, my, uh, have any effect on my vocal range. Mm. I, I just dropped the bad joke. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you know, it, it was purchased by early adopters. I wouldn't say that, you know, the, the, the Mac was a, 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 a phenomenal seller. The Apple II product line carried that company for a very, very long time, the Mac was, was bought by really early adopters. I mean, using, you know, even Mac right on a single drive system. I mean, you had like carpal tunnel syndrome and whatnot, swapping the floppy disk in and out. It was not easy. If you wanted to do work and productivity and education, I mean, the Apple II line had a tremendous software library and Per hardware peripherals and, and whatnot. And then, of course, they had even a little bit more confusion, you know, when the Apple II GS came out. Well, gee, that, that thing has color. The Mac is only black and white. A huge help was the SWIM chip. Sander Wozniak integrated machine. The SWIM chip in the Macintosh SE allowed it to format, read, and write IBM PC three and a half inch floppies. Now, Someone who had PCs in their office and they were using Microsoft Word, oh, you know, I need to finish this document at home. Now that disk was able to be read and written on their Mac at home. From my viewpoint, where the Mac really took off, though, uh, was with desktop publishing. Now, this was not something that wasn't necessarily planned by Apple, but when a company called Aldis came out with PageMaker, and it was Aldous PageMaker version 3, which was 1988, and you bundled that with an Apple LaserWriter Plus, an Apple LaserWriter printer. That system with the software and whatnot, it was like a $12,000 system. Uh, that did what a $50,000 typesetting system would do. All right? That was blow away. And, uh, and that's how 
uh, uh, help the max su- success in with the creative people because it kind of backdoored into corporate America via the graphics professionals. So you met Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak a few times around this period. What did you take away from meeting them at the time? It was an Apple dealer meeting, maybe 82 or 83. They were rolling out a uh, uh, mouse for the Apple II. And um, uh, it was it was pretty cool that, that Steve Jobs came to this meeting. I, I was director at a company called Sonicraft in Manhattan, and um, the vice president, his name is Jerry Goulden. And I said, "Wow, well, uh, Jerry, it was kind of cool that, that Steve came to the meeting." He said, uh, "Yeah, would you would you like to meet him?" I said, "Ah, oh, Jerry, I don't really want to bother him." He said, "What's the bother? You're selling millions of dollars of his products, and you help put him up there." So, and we, listen, we're all suited up, full blown business mode in Manhattan. So, so. Jerry gets up and he kind of pulls me through and he goes, you know, pardon me, Mr. Jobs, I just wanted to introduce you to my young director of, uh, of my company and he just wanted to shake your hand. I put my hand out and Steve looks at me and just snubs the handshake and, and, and walks away and Jerry was like, that son of a bitch. I'm like, Jerry, Jerry, it's no big deal. My, <laughs> the VP was really angry. He thought it was just so rude. Uh, but, you know, classic Steve. Listen, bright guy, forward thinker, uh, but in my opinion, you know, from firsthand experience, not a very warm and friendly fellow. Uh, uh, Almost firsthand experience. Yeah, right, 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 right. <laughs> right. Just saying. Uh, but, you know, uh, very different from, from Waz. You know, my first actually sit down with Waz was at that 1983 developer conference. It was an outdoor lunch and there was a lot of just round tables there. And I noticed Waz and there was an open seat at his table. And I asked it, gee, uh, can I can I sit here? He said, sure, join us, and and it was really cool. Like I said, very warm, friendly person, nice hug, hello. You know, Waz is really into numbers. You know, especially when he's in with his uh, the hotel rooms. Like you know, he'll like a room number one hundred and one. It's binary, or room three one four, which is pi. And and we're wrapping up a dinner, and I said, you know, Waz, too bad you didn't get room one thirty four. And and here I see Waz just kind of like stop his tracks and he's trying to reverse engineer the mathematical significance of 134 and he goes well, alpha what's so special about 134 and i say come on why is it rhymes at one dirty whore and he just busted out laughing it was, it was all 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 in good fun this is waz's metal business Ooh. card it's beautiful you know what, what it, business is listed on that because he's actually started a few uh, over the years oh uh, it's just a uh, waz.org you know, oh, just okay. his, his website. Pers- Him personally. Per- like a personal, yeah, like a calling card. And, and you know, he had shared with me how he, uh, he, he was taking a flight and he opened up like a bunch of packets of sweet and low, you know, white powder. And he's with this metal card and he's chopping it up <laughs> on the on the plane and the flight attendant like sort of was coke. She's like, sir, you, you, you can't do that. <laughs> He's like, whoa, whoa, what's the problem? Listen, he, you know, he's a jokester and a prankster. I remember him telling me about uh, his girlfriend at the time, now wife, and uh, how, you know, Alfred, you know, she loves, you know, going to movies and, and, and she gets me really thoughtful gifts. And, and when he said that phrase, I said, at your level, I thought she'd be buying you JPEGs. And he continues his conversation. <laughs> and I go, whoa, 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 Waz, you didn't get the joke? He goes, what joke? I said, you said she, she buys you very thoughtful gifts. I said, at your level, she should be getting you JPEGs. Oh, Alfred, that's a good one. I missed that one. <laughs> so we have a lot of laughs. Just great guy. Mm-hmm. Great guy and mm-hmm. a brilliant engineer. After the first few years of the Mac's existence, the line starts to diverge into like full-size desktop computers, portable computers. Some would say the Mac was maturing as a platform. Some would say Apple didn't have any product direction. What did you think at the time? I'm looking at, at that point in time, Quadra 630, Macintosh LC 630, Performa 630. I mean, the product line was, was at one point just off the wall crazy with a number of SKUs and, 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 and things like that. I mean, I'm just looking at some of this, this documentation and some of the product overview. Holy cow. I mean, it's like nuts. Uh, but the switch over to power PC... I mean, I was pretty excited about that, you know, looking at the, the, the power of those systems. And then OS X was, was uh, 
uh, it felt like a whole new computer going from OS 9 to 10. You know, I'm like, gosh darn it, I just got finally everything nice and perfect and stable under OS 9. <laughs> Uh, a little bit of a frustration at first, but uh, a big fan of the Power Mac G3. That Power Mac G4, I had a digital audio system. I think it's still rotting in storage. iMac, great systems, you know, uh, uh, big, uh, you know, big turnaround for Apple. So a few years into the Macintosh, you personally transitioned into a career in advertising and marketing. Were you still using Macs at work? And, uh, you know, were PCs ever considered? Hybrid, by platform, um, uh, with my own ad agency. I mean, the back end was Windows Server, Outlook, Macs in there as well for the graphics work and whatnot. But then it, later it evolved where I got rid of all the PCs and we all had Macs and then we ran Windows virtualized. But <laughs> running Windows on the Mac under virtualization was better than running on a PC. It was great. We all, you know, we also hung on to Windows XP for an extended long time. Let me tell you how lightning fast <laughs> XP ran on those jacked up Mac systems. Good stuff. Uh, the whole world hung on to Windows XP for too long. Oh, oh yes, absolutely. <laughs> So starting in 1998, the Mac starts a five-year transition into radical new hardware products and an all-new operating system. You know, from a modern perspective, you know, we look fondly back on the, the quirky computers that came out of that period and, you know, the glossy aqua pinstripes in OS X. But what did it feel like as a Mac user living through that period? You know, after times, listen, it's just like when, you know, uh, your favorite homepage changes the layout. You know, mm. back in the day, back in the day, you know, yahoo.com was, was my homepage. And every once in a while, they would just change the layout and you just get frustrated, but then you get used to it, you know? And, and for the most part, one of the things that I did like is, is as OS 10 matured over time, you know, unlike some of the Windows operating systems, when they did updates or whatnot, the systems got bogged down even more. As OS 10 was refined, the system actually got better. Um, imagine that. Yeah, imagine that. So, <laughs> so where do you think the Mac is going next? Uh, continue refinement. Obviously, we're going to keep on seeing improvements with the M series chips. You know, greater performance, less power, whatever. Of course, you know the Vision Pro is now going to be integrated in that as well. I mean, obviously, Vision Pro gives us a whole new paradigm with the spatial computing. But you know, Vision Pro will also talk to your MacBook Pro, what I like to see in the future, let's go forward 20 years, I like to see photonic computing. Right, enough of this pushing electrons through the chips, let's go with light. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I know they're working on it. I don't know if Apple's working on it particularly, but uh, that would be you know, how I would extrapolate 20, 30 years into the future. So do you plan on buying a Vision Pro? It's on the radar, I definitely want to try it out. Uh, um, if I was really smart, I'd buy two. What would I do with mm. the other one, Griffin? Keep it wrapped in the box. In the box, right. That's going to be, I'm telling you, it's going to be a hot collectible. And I think we can look at the Vision Pro uh, almost analogous to the Lisa. Here we have the first iteration, a very premium, high-priced system. And then the technology is going to filter down to prices a little bit more more friendly for business, consumer, etc. So what is your, your Mac setup like now? What computers and devices do you have? And, you know, what do you use it all for? Uh, the, the current system is, I'm using uh, uh, the Mac Pro 6.1, aka the trash can, or also, as I refer to it as the Intel version of the Mac Studio. That's what it is. It's the Intel version of the Mac Studio. Three monitors on it. There's about five printers hooked up to it. There's a Mac Mini as a, as a, a subsystem just to handle some of the synthesizers. I don't know if that audio is coming through, uh, but I got some synth gear off, off camera angle. And then I have a, a Mac Pro 12 core cheese grater uh, for my music studio because I collect synthesizers. Did uh, try buying a, uh, a, a new Mac Studio with the M2 Ultra. Uh, the, the trash can actually does everything I need except doing the AI upscaling using uh, products from Topaz Labs, their Topaz video upscaler. The trash can upscaled a one-minute video. It took 
two hours and the machine was like 198 degrees of it was going to blow up so i said okay this is now a reason to buy a new system and and i bought the second to top of the line Mac studio i figured yeah, i'll get seven years out of this thing like eight grand after i loaded it up with all the software that i use it failed um, you know, <laughs> Safari wouldn't run. Firefox puked out. I, you know, something broke it, obviously. Already right out of the box, freaking Firefox crashed. What did I do? Nothing. Yeah, Macs don't crash. Yeah, I, I, and Google Chrome crashed as well. A piece of shit, really. Holy crap, I, I might send this Mac Studio back. I'm launching Safari. Uh, how many times are we going to bounce in the dock? I returned it. Uh, Sonoma needs more time and the software developers need a little more time to get everything in sync. Hopefully an M3 Ultra will be out uh, and, and I'll go another round. But right now the trash can is doing the job except for the upscaling. So let's talk about your YouTube channel a little bit at the end here. <laughs> I would describe your videos as angry Florida man yells about computer. How would you introduce your YouTube channel to a new audience? Pure art perfect <laughs> moving right along <laughs> yeah well yeah yeah don't watch any of it it's all crap uh, i i think my goal has been to lower the bar in tech videos uh, uh, in, in, since 2006 it's all tongue-in-cheek um mm. there's only really two serious videos ever produced which was the lisa 25 years later and then the next q demo most of the, the the big youtube channels are paying sponsors uh companies pay me not to buy their product and not to do an unboxing video really uh it was funny an ad agency for epson reached out to me a few years ago because they 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 wrote me an email and said look we you know we we, we we've seen your videos and and we want to send you this very expensive epson high definition projector to do an unboxing and review so I wrote back to the ad agency, basically one sentence, really? Which video did you see? There was like a three-day pause, and I got a response mm -hmm. back from the ad agency, oh, <laughs> thanks for the heads up. I didn't want her to lose her job. <laughs> when you were shooting unboxings or other home movies before online video, did you ever think they'd have an audience outside of your immediate family and friends? I, 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 my thought was, let me capture this content and I'll figure it out later. Uh, did I extrapolate YouTube? No, but actually uh, the first platform before YouTube I used was dot Mac dot Mac offered a platform to upload a video. It put a, 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 a stage and a, and a curtain and it presented your video. It allowed comments. Basically Apple had YouTube before YouTube and that's how I was distributing uh, uh, some of the videos I did. Dot Mac, you know, that, that video sharing platform was, was phenomenal. It was really very good. For every Apple success story, like the Dot Mac and the uh, Hypercar, there's, there's something like CyberDog, if you remember that. Yeah, <laughs> the thing was on the e front lawn. <laughs> yeah, e right, E-World, e e right. What else did Apple have? This binder, Apple New, new Dealer Orientation you know, more Apple publications. And here they're talking about HyperCard, you know, and HyperCard, how phenomenal. It was like the precursor to the, to the World Wide Web. This is from like 79. When you were, became blessed by Apple to be an authorized dealer, there's the plaque signed by someone at Apple that you displayed in your store. Yeah, here you go. Here's an Apple car. That's the... I think it was a Porsche, the race car they had, 1980. That that is the official miniature. If Apple did a did a race car now, they, it wouldn't have any other logos on it. It would just be all white with a single gray Apple on the hood. <laughs> You're right. Uh, this was a little gift at the 1983 Apple Developer Conference. There's a little digital clock Ooh. made out of Plex, and the clock is mm -hmm. as dead as my friend's marriage. Uh, but it's it's still a kind of a cool cool piece tape that came with the Mac with the Picasso. The Apple Picasso mm -hmm. logo. When the Mac was launched in 1984, Steve Jobs had one of these go to every authorized dealer to sit in the store window. Now, I commissioned the Lumonic Studio to make a custom base to give it some LED light. Wow, here's a rare Apple promotional poster. Of course, I always say worth millions, 
Matt Gronig. Uh, it's called Bongo's Dream Dorm. And let's do a slow Alfredot TV pan shot. And uh, at the bottom it says Macintosh, part of every student's wildest dreams. Oh, and here we have a lovely Apple II Plus. Apple II Plus. Listen to the sound of that keyboard. And there it is, the 20th anniversary Mac, which I use as a CD player. Let's boot this thing. Oh, come on. That sound is great. And whilst it's booting, we'll go over here to, I think this was a, a Mac 512. It had an internal 20 megabyte hard drive, which doesn't work. And it's a little bit in stealth mode, but there indeed is a next cube and that does work, at least, at least the last time I booted it up. And we're getting a nice Mac OS 7 on the TAM. Oh, look at that, there's the book. The, the Cult of Mac. I don't know, did you guys all write that one? So what video projects are you working on now that people can look forward to? Uh, well, let's see, I have, I have two new HomePods rotting on a table in the studio side condo. Uh, so mm -hmm. uh, maybe I'll, I'll film a crappy unboxing video and I'll give you a shout out. Mm -hmm. Where can people find you online? Uh, you can find me online at the Italian bakery, uh, at the local supermarket. You can find me online at the uh, USPS Postal Service for uh, when I send out late Christmas gifts. Uh, but uh, speaking seriously for a brief moment, uh, it's um, alfred.tv. Uh, that website has the anti-social media links on there and a little bit of backstory. Uh, I do have an email address. Uh, I wanted it to be something unique. So instead of mail at alfred.tv, it's, uh, you know, mail sack, M-A-I-L-S-A-C-K at alfred.tv. But of course, M-A-L-E-S-A-C-K at alfred.tv also works just to be funny. YouTube.com uh, at my first initial, A, last name, de Blasi, D-I-B-L-A-S-I. -S uh, so you start at alfred.tv, all the links are there. So that's where you can find me. Thank you so much for joining us for this wonderful conversation. I'm going to end the video the same way you end your videos, by saying, welcome to cultofmac.com. <laughs> Take care, Griffin. Thank you again. <laughs>